worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time. Thank you, Lord, so much that we can gather together this morning and bless your holy name, that we can worship you, that we can honor you, that we can lift our voices, our minds, attention, our hearts, affection to you, Father, that we can join together wherever we are uh, all across this city, and Father, just honor you with our, with our minds and with our hearts and with our lips and, Father, with our actions. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have worship together we pray, God, that you will just bless the remainder of this worship time. May we continue to honor you with our songs and with, with our uh, sermon text and preaching today. And Father, may everything that we do and say be about you this morning. We pray, God, for, uh, for, for our church. We pray, God, that you will just help us to continue to be the church, be the light in this city, in this community, as we seek to reach others for you and share the love uh, of Christ around with those we come in contact with. Help us to, 
to find ways to serve others, to find ways to, to talk to others about their faith and to encourage them and to be an encouragement to all those that we come in contact with. And Father, we just thank you so much for all those who continue to meet week after week during this time of uncertainty to provide and, and uh, skillfully present these worship services online so that we can stay together as a community. And so, Father, we pray, God, that we will just, uh, as your people, be your people and live for you. And Father, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to, to be with you this morning. We're excited about the worship service and, and our worship time today. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to, to something coming up, and I promised a big announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so here's your big announcement. Uh, we are going to uh, be presenting in a series of online services uh, some preaching, some preaching and music services, some worship services, beginning on May the 31st. And so we're going to have, it's kind of in the style of a revival, but it's not a revival. We're going to be calling it an encouragement for the saints. And so we just want to encourage you. So we're excited to have uh, people here on our staff to lead this. So on Sunday morning, I'll be preaching as usual. On Sunday night, we'll present online on the 31st. Pastor Frank will be preaching. Pastor David will be on Monday night, uh, June the 1st. And then on Tuesday night, Pastor Josh and I'll wind us up on Wednesday. So we're going to have some, some awesome times of worship that will be available online. Uh, as you know, the, the governor has stated that live venues are not to be open, uh, meaning concerts and things like that, until uh, after the 31st. So uh, we, we are looking at maybe something, sometime in June, hopefully coming back. But until that time, we're going to continue to provide these online opportunities for you. And so we decided we'd just throw a little something in there extra for you in the way of encouragement. So I hope you will look forward to that, that you will pray for these folks that will be preaching and the music that will be taking place as we'll be recording those services over the next few weeks and then putting them out uh, for that week of encouragement for the saints. We look forward to that. Also, I wanted to let you know that we will be uh, continuing to take up uh, this week will be the last week, uh, and into Sunday, the 24th, will be our last week to take up the Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions. Uh, we have around 5,900, almost 6,000 right now. Uh, so we have almost met our goal. I'm sure we probably will meet it in the next few days. So praise the Lord for that. Let's continue to be about sharing the gospel uh, in North America and around the world and in your own neighborhood. Let's share the gospel together. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you. If you're a first-time guest today, we're glad that you have joined in to watch. We're so thankful you're here, and we'd love to, for you to join us when we begin to meet back. Uh, if you need any information about the church, just click on one of the staff uh, photos there and, and their email address and give us an email, and we'll be glad to get back with you and give you some information about the church. Well, it's good to be here this morning. Let us continue to worship.
far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Oh glorious day me 
together father we thank you lord so much again to lift our voices up to you our hearts our our petitions father we we have so many requests in our minds right now father whether they be for salvation for those that we know that are lost for a personal situation that's going on in our own lives father we pray for our church and We pray, God, that you will help us to be the light that you've called us to be in this time. Father, we pray, God, that you will be with this time of uh, of worship, this time of praise, this time of honoring you. Father, more than that, what we want to do today is we just want to thank you, Lord, that you are the creator of all things. Father, that you... Hold all things together. You sustain all things. Father, that you are our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, our Father. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have the Spirit living in us. We've been made alive together with you in your kingdom forever. And Father, we look forward to living forever and ever with you. And Father, as we enter this time of study, we pray, God, that you will just help our minds to be affected and impacted by what we read, by what we study, and Father, it to prompt us to action in our daily lives. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. As Christians at East Newton Baptist Church, I pray that we understand fully what it is that we are called to do as God's people, what the purpose and goal of our lives is is and you'll be reminded when we went through the mission statement study several weeks ago 
we talked a little bit about what our overarching purpose is, and it's to bring glory to God, to honor God in all that we do. And so our church is about honoring God. Your life is about honoring God. Your family is about honoring God. Everything you say and do is about honoring God. So in all we do, in all we say, in all we, we, we think, in, in all that we interact with as a church, our goal, our purpose in life is to honor and glorify God. And so this means that we should take seriously the effort in our lives to become more like Christ, to more and more every day take on the personality, the actions, and the mind of Christ. We must orient our daily lives around the idea of growing spiritually. A stagnant Christian should not take place in the life of a Christian in, the, in this church or any church. We should be growing. We should see progress. Now, that doesn't mean time, there won't be times where we have a little bit of a, a, a slump, if you will, in our spiritual growth, or we might have some difficulties that come our way that cause us to kind of have a little bit of a valley, but, but we are to pro be progressing. We are to look back over our lives and see a progress of spiritual growth. How tragic is it to see someone who has been a Christian for many, many years, maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years, and they are not growing in their walk with the Lord. How tragic is it to see so many babes in Christ in the church, people that should be further along in the way that they live, the way that they treat one another, the way that they share the message with those who are lost, but we have so many babes in Christ in the churches in our land today. Our lives should be focused on discipleship and growth. And there are areas in the life of a disciple of Christ that should be experiencing spiritual growth at all times. We should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This means that we should be learning about who he is. We can't take on his character unless we're learning about who he is. We can't be like him unless we know what like him looks like. And so we have to grow. We have to understand God's character. We have to understand what God requires of us and how he's called us to interact with him. And so we should grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his character and actions and his interactions with people. We should learn what is expected or even required of a disciple. You know, there are commands in Scripture, and sometimes people will say, we're under grace, not under law. We don't, we don't have to be so focused on those commands. But my question to you is, why would God give us the commands if we shouldn't focus on them? Yes, we don't save ourselves through our works, but shouldn't you, who has been bought with a price, who has been brought into the kingdom of God, who is, was in the muck and mire of our lostness and now is found and brought into the kingdom of God, shouldn't we desire to do what God wants us to do? Shouldn't we desire to obey the commands of God? And so we need to find out what's required and expected of a disciple. We should also grow in our devotion to the Lord and learn each day to worship Him in a deep deeper and richer and fuller way. We should also be growing in our love for others. Just because you're in the church doesn't mean that the more holy you get, the more you look down on people, the more you judge people. No, the, the idea is the more holy you get, the more you love people, the more you're willing to consider their interest as more important than your own and to not be judgmental over them, but to share the truth in love with them. And so we should be growing in our love with others and our heart to help others and to see them come to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should grow in our willingness to think of the interest of others as more important than our own interest. You know, we, we should live our lives thinking about the interest of others. We shouldn't be so focused on ourselves. Listen, don't get me wrong, we have to worry about ourselves, we have to eat, we have to make sure we got clothes, we have to make sure our families are taken care of, so it's not as if we don't worry about ourselves, it's just that the interests associated with us are less important than the interests associated with people outside of us. In our text today, we will look at, at how we are to grow in the area of our usefulness to the Lord. Each of us should desire to be useful to the Lord, should be desired to have a purpose and fulfill that purpose in the ways of the Lord. And true spiritual growth will manifest itself in our lives through how useful we are, our usefulness. So the question this morning I would ask you is, are you useful in the kingdom of God? As we become more useful, 
We will make ourselves more and more useful to the Lord's plan in our lives, the Lord's purpose for our lives. And so the Apostle Paul teaches about this concept of becoming a useful vessel in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20 and 21. If you could turn in your Bibles there, and we will stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. The Apostle Paul says this to Timothy. Now in a great house, there are, many, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You may be seated. Father, we pray, God, that you will bless the reading of your word, the study of it. Father, that you will use this word to make us more attentive to what it means to be useful in the kingdom. And, Father, that you will help us to be more useful in the kingdom of God. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. In this passage, Paul compares the Christian to a vessel a pot or jar or utensil of some kind that is to be used for his service. The scripture contains several instances of the idea of God referring to his child as some type of vessel, maybe a a clay pot or something like that. Romans 9, 21 says, Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? And so it is in Scripture that we see that God talks about us and and through his his writers and his men who have written Scripture, he talks about us as some type of vessel. In Paul's day, much like our day, there are many different types of vessels and containers that are used for different purposes, not only in the house, but uh, or in your house, in other ways as well. And there is a profound difference between an old coffee mug that you drink out of every day and a cup and saucer of fine china that you purchased around your, or were given around your wedding time. You don't use those in the same way. You don't mind if your coffee mug has a little chip on it, but your fine china you never would want to damage. And so you take much different care of it because it has a different use. There's a big difference between an expensive vase and a garbage can. They have different uses. They have different purpose, purposes, and we treat them differently. God has called believers to be vessels of honor. We are profoundly different from non-believers that he has called for dishonorable purposes. So the question for today is this. What kind of vessel does God want us to be? Or to put it more pointedly, what kind of vessel are you? From our text today, I believe first he wants us to be a Uh, Be vessels of usefulness. Vessels of usefulness. Look at verse 21. He will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. We are called to be vessels of usefulness to the master. In the Old Testament, we see that vessels were used for the temple service, and they were to remain set apart as holy. That is, they were to be kept ceremonially clean. They they could not come in contact with something that was ceremonially unclean. If they were contaminated in any way, they were either cleansed in some ritualistic way or they were destroyed and another one was made. The analogy is clear. God will only use vessels that have been cleansed for his purposes. And he has made us holy, and he has cleansed us by sending his son, Jesus Christ. You remember, we were unholy. We were outside of God's plan. We were lost. We were worthless before God. And the sin that was in our life caused us to be unacceptable to God. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to make us holy by sending his son to die for us so that we could be raised to a new life and made holy. Jesus took our punishment. We were once unworthy for 
the Lord's service. We were once unholy for the Lord's service, but he has, through the blood of Christ, made us holy and worthy and acceptable for his service. And although we can never lose our salvation, we can never go to that position we were at before, we can't allow sin and uncleanness to, uncleanness to enter into our lives and will once again make us not very useful in the kingdom of God. So what is Paul referring to? Well, if we are growing in Christ, if we are walking with Christ, if we are moving towards Christ's likeness in our lives, we become more and more useful to God as a vessel in the kingdom of God. Our growth is about making our daily lives that we live every day match our position of holiness that we've been given when we've been made, we've been, when we've been made right in the eyes of God through justification. So if our daily lives are ungodly, if our daily lives are focused on ourselves, if, we're, if our daily lives are focused on us getting our own way, us being a mean-spirited person, us being an evil person sometimes to other people, then we can never be usable in the kingdom of God. What a tragedy to see a child of God sitting on the sidelines of service because they have allowed themselves to become unusable in the kingdom. So then the question is, how do we become useful again? How do we become useful again? It's pretty simple, really. And I'm not going to get into a long detail on this. I'm going to make this very simple. We have to first acknowledge our sin, accept responsibility for what it is that we have done to become unholy. And we must repent of that sin. We must truly turn from God and be sorry for that sin. And we must ask God to help us to overcome that sin and temptation. And then we will become more and more useful to God. The song, The Potter, written by Andre Crouch, says this. The potter, he saw a vessel that had been broken by the wind and the rain. He sought it with so much compassion to put it back together again. Oh, I was that broken vessel that no one thought was any good. I cried, Lord, you are the potter, and I'm the clay. Make me over again today. Jesus picked up the pieces of my broken heart, of my broken heart that day, and he made me a new vessel. He revived my soul again. We must come to God and recognize that we're not useful for the kingdom when we've got sin in our lives, that we're not useful for the kingdom when our focus is on ourselves. We're not useful to the kingdom when we're not focused on who God is. We must repent. If you've not been useful in the kingdom because of sin, understand that unusefulness is not what you've been created for. We've been saved, we've been created, we've been saved, we've been redeemed so that we could be useful in the kingdom. We are the ones that God has called to share the message of the gospel. We're the ones that God has purposed to be the message bearers. He could have used his angels, but he chose to use us. We must be useful for the kingdom. We must repent of our sin and ask God to make us useful every single day. And if you're unuseful, Ask God to make you useful again. Not only has God called us to be vessels of usefulness, he's called us to be vessels to show the handiwork of God on the earth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The life of a Christian is a testimony about God on display for all to see. You hear that? The life of a Christian is a testimony. We are put on display. So not that we can bring attention to ourselves, not that we can bring attention to our own glory, but so God can use us 
to show himself strong to the world through us, where everybody can look at us and say, hey, you know, I recognize that's a weak vessel, but God must have been doing something through him or her. But, sadly, many Christians do not put on the glory of God in their lives or put the glory of God on display in their lives. William R. N. said this, the worst enemies of Christianity are bad Christians. <laughs> Those that dishonor God's name with their lives. It's important to note that we are useful to the master, not only because we are part of his family, but because we belong to the master and he's working through us. Our usefulness is based on his presence in our lives. We are his special possession. He purchased us with the high price of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. As such, our lives should be focused on bringing honor to the Lord and showing the world that God is glorious. The Bible is a record of people who have put their lives on display to show the glory of God in this world. Think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember the story. You probably heard it in Sunday school when you were a child or in VBS or something like that. This is the story of those young men, young Hebrew men who were asked to bow down and worship an idol. They would not. And so Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the fiery furnace. They could be seen in the furnace walking around, and there was another character in there with them, another person in there with them walking around shining. They came out. Not even the clothes that they were wearing were singed after being thrown into the furnace. Why? Was it because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were great people? Was it because they were just stellar people of God? No, it was because they made themselves useful to God and he put his glory on display in their lives so that everyone could look at them and see it wasn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was their God who protected them. And there are story after story after story in the Old Testament and the New Testament about how God put himself on display in regular, ordinary people like you and me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles as last of all, like men sent us to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. So we become spectacles as we serve God. We put his glory on display like the apostles were called to do. Our goal is to prove to the world that the grace of God is sufficient to accomplish all of his good pleasure so that the people in the world see God's work on display in our lives. And we are to make the way of holiness attractive to the world. If people see something different about us, they see the glory of God in us, they understand that we have some standards that the world does not have, some some things that we follow that the world does not have, and, and they see that, and they want to take on that holiness in their own lives. So it makes the holiness of God attractive as well. Someone once said, no one ever went into God's presence that did not come out a better man. And so we are to be vessels that show God's handiwork in this world here on earth. And then thirdly, we are vessels to contain God's spirit of power. 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? In the Old Testament, we're told that one day God will pour his spirit out on his people. And Jesus proclaimed that when he left, he would send back a power, his spirit. That would be the comforter. That would be the God. That would be the one that was here with the people of God. 
One of the greatest blessings of salvation, and I think sometimes we we forget this, but we would do well to remember it. One of the greatest blessings of salvation is that the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell in us when we are saved. That when we are made alive together with Christ, we have a spirit within us that is the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and so we become holy by submitting to the work of the Spirit in us. And listen, if you know that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you, you will desire to be useful to the Spirit. How glorious is it that we are ordinary people, vessels of imperishable, uh, of perishable and corruptible seed, who have been made imperishable and incorruptible through the power of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us. It's not as if we're made just simply spiritually alive at salvation. We are, but we're made alive and forever grafted into God's family. And so His Spirit dwells in us. And so if the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, then the Spirit of God is to overflow from us as we interact with other people. As we share the blessings of Christ with the world. John 4, 13 to 14 says this, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's the Holy Spirit living in us. And so not only are we to be containers that are useful to God, Not only are we to be containers that show the glory of God and his handiwork to the world, but we are to be vessels that contain the actual spirit of God. That means when we walk day by day, God is walking with us. It means that he is with us and knows our inmost thoughts. He knows our desires. He knows our hearts. And if we listen to him, we'll learn his desires. He will guide us. He will help us to walk. And we can relate to God on a level that we could never have imagined in our lost state. And many times we don't imagine in our saved state. God is in us and with us. Church, do you not realize that the Spirit of God is living in you, that He is with you day by day? When you sin, He is right there with you. And when you serve, He is right there with you, giving you the strength and the courage and the power to do what He's called you to do. What a privilege it is to have the Spirit of God living in us. But I want you to know that with great privilege comes great responsibility. Are there issues in your daily life that are causing you to be an unclean vessel? And are there things in your lives that are causing you to be set aside for service for the Lord right now until you figure out those things and get them right? Are we wasting the precious time that we have on this earth? Remember last week I said life is a vapor. That's what James said. Are we wasting our time being set aside because we're unuseful for the kingdom because of some sin or heart problem in our lives? So what does a Christian look like that contains the Spirit of God? Turn with me back in your scriptures to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I want you to listen to the verses before and after our text today. It says, remind them of these things. Paul is speaking to Timothy here, and he says, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will only lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hamaeus and Philetus, 
who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee from useful passions and pursue righteous faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. There's kind of a picture of what someone who is useful to the kingdom looks like and a picture of what someone who is not useful to the kingdom may look like. Only when we deal with the sin that is in our lives can we be useful to God and honor Him with our lives. This morning, I'm going to call upon you to submit yourself to the Lord. I'm going to call upon you to repent of any sin that may be in your life. And I'm going to call upon you to become useful for the Lord, to show His glory to the world because the Spirit of God lives in you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this text. And I pray, God, that as we listen in today, as we focus in today, that, Father, you will help us, Lord, to know each and every day the things that are in our lives that cause us to not be who you've called us to be, to live in a way that is opposite of what you've called us to live. Now, Father, this morning... You're calling the saints at East Newton Baptist Church to, to repent of sins, to repent of attitudes and thoughts, to repent of unkindness and self-centered ways, to make ourselves useful for the kingdom once again. Oh, God, help us to be useful. Help us to put you first in our lives. Help us to put your glory on display in all that we do. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. With your heads bowed, I'm going to ask the band to play for a moment. Right where you are, just think about the sin that may be in your life the wrong attitudes that may be in your life, and repent right now. And say, oh God, make me useful for your kingdom. Help me to put on your glory in my life. Help me to draw others to you. And help me to be an honorable vessel that contains the spirit of the living God. Just take a moment and pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to repent, this opportunity to draw attention to the things in our lives that may be making us unuseful. And God, I would that every saint in this church would become more and more useful for you. Not for our own glory, but for your glory, for the growth of this church, for the salvation of souls, for the discipling and multiplying your children Father help us to get it Lord help us to understand it help us to stop focusing on ourselves and seek you first in all that we do in the name of Jesus we pray Amen
calls me his own. Thank you so much for joining in today. It's good to see you, and I pray that we all can be useful for the kingdom of God. Closing courses, what a day that will be. What a day that